Great. No. So thank you very much for coming today. And I'll speak on the Bhagavad Gita 18.22. The topic will be when knowledge works and when it doesn't. When wisdom, some people receive wisdom and they benefit from it. And some people receive wisdom and they reject it. So why does wisdom work sometimes and why does it not work sometimes? So that will be the topic we'll discuss. This is 18.22 in the Gita. It is Krishna is talking about knowledge in the three modes. How knowledge itself can be used differently by different people. So yattu kritsnavade kasmin karye sattamahe tukam atatvartava dalpamcha tattamasam udaharatam that one those people who think that one thing is everything. Yattu kritsnavad ekasmin. Kritsnavad is everything. Ekasmin is one thing. Those who take one thing to be everything. Karye saktamahe tukam. And then they become focused on just one kind of activity. Atatvar thavad alpamcha. They don't consider the big picture. They consider their small window to be the complete reality. That is knowledge in the mode of ignorance. So normally we think knowledge and ignorance to be opposite things. If we gain knowledge, we come out of ignorance. But is it possible that some people gain knowledge and that doesn't remove their ignorance, that reinforces their ignorance? So once there was an uh, anti-alcoholic, anti-alcohol campaigner and he was addressing a group of people who were trying to recover from alcohol. And he said, now I will demonstrate to you how dangerous alcohol is. So he had a glass of alcohol and he had a small bottle in which he had trapped an insect. So he opened the bottle and threw that insect into the bottle of alcohol. The insect fluttered for a few moments and then it sank to the ground and dead. So he looked at all the hearing alcoholics and he said, well, so what do you learn from it? All of them became green. He started looking down, wondering the implications. One of them became very perky and cheerful. He says, so what do you learn from this? He said, when we drink alcohol, all the germs in our stomach will die. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is knowledge that doesn't remove ignorance. In what it does it? It reinforces ignorance. <laughs> that means we all have certain preconceptions. And if we hold on to those preconceptions, then everything that we learn, everything new that we learn, it, it is passing through that. And then we try to fit everything into that. So there are two things. There is being unguided and there is being misguided. Unguided means we don't know what is right. Say if we are on a road and it's an unfamiliar road, maybe the internet is not there, so Google Maps is not working. Or which is the app you use over here? Some other app used for navigation here? MapQuest. MapQuest or? Google Maps. Google, okay. So, GPS, any GPS app we use. So, so it's not working. Then we don't know where to go. You know, we may wait and we may ask someone, we'll try to confirm. That is the state of being unguided. But there is a state of being misguided. That means that we are either told by someone, go in this direction. Or like some people, they have a big ego. So they don't know where they're going, but they don't like to admit that they don't know. They just keep going. Maybe this is not the way. No, it is the way. And they're going further and further away from the destination. They're not admi admitting it. So that's misguided. Mm -hmm. So there is unguided and misguided. Mm -hmm. So unguided people are having ignorance. And if they get knowledge, their ignorance is removed. But misguided people, you know, when they, they don't have knowledge, Rather, they have wrong knowledge. But when they get knowledge, what happens is they think, I already know the right thing. So they reject the knowledge and they take from it whatever will reinforce.
their own preconceptions. And that is why such people find it very difficult. For such people to learn is very difficult. There was a European philosopher, he said that the problem with the world is that the foolish are cocksure and the wise are full of doubts. So that is a misfortune. It's completely sure this is what I need to do. And unfortunately, those who have knowledge, maybe this is right, maybe it's not right, a lot of hesitation. And that's what creates problems. So in the Bhagavatam, in the, the Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto, it is said that when we get spiritual knowledge, the wisdom from the scriptures, from the wisdom texts, uh, which talk about spirituality, that knowledge is meant to be like light. And light removes darkness. There is even a small amount of light is extremely powerful. That a little lightning, sorry, a little candle, that can dissipate darkness. In fact, on its own, all the darkness in the world can't extinguish even a single candle. The darkness can't extinguish the candle. But if the candle starts thinking that, oh, I'm so small, the darkness is so big, what is the use of my burning? Then the candle may get extinguished. The, the point is, light is very powerful. And light can remove darkness, just as knowledge can remove ignorance. But the problem is that for some people, this light, light of spiritual wisdom, it doesn't act like a light it acts like a lightning. Now, what is the difference between a light and a lightning? It's fast. It's fast and it is? Fast means in what sense? It comes very quickly? That's true, but something more uh, dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> That's strikes. Destructive. Destructive. Loud. Loud. Okay, all are true. Mm. Okay, in terms of if you want to read a book, which is better, light or lightning? Light. light. Why? Because it's longer, it lasts, and lightning is just for a second. Yes, exactly. Both give light. All the answers you gave were correct. The, <coughs> the relevant answer here is that the feature that matters. Some, some people, oh, I understand this is right. But after some time, they just completely forget it. So that's like lightning. It strikes, but it's there only for a short while and it's gone. So the Bhagavad Gita, the book which we are talking about, it is a part of a larger book, one of the biggest books in the world. Which is that book? Mahabharata. Yeah, the Mahabharata. Thank you. So in the, in the Mahabharata, the follow-up, of uh, the events that happen after the Bhagavad Gita are spoken are described. In the Mahabharata war, there is Krishna, who is God, descended on the earth, and he is uh, he is fighting on the side of virtue, which is led by who are the leaders on one side? Does anyone know? The devas. The devas. Sorry. Uh, I mean the leaders and the devas. Yeah, leaders. Oh, good. You're the strength leader. Thank you. So they are collectively called as the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Yeah. So now Duryodhan is. Is, is at one level an embodiment of envy. He just can't be satisfied. You know, among all the uh, various impurities that are in our heart, envy has a peculiar characteristic. Envy targets the envied, but torments the envious. So I, if I feel envious of someone else, I'm targeting the other person. But the other person may not even know that we are envious of them. We target someone else, but who is tormented by it? We ourselves are tormented by it. So we could say envy is, envy is distorted respect. Normally respect is offered voluntarily and usually happily. But envy is also respect, but offered unwillingly and even resentfully. So you, know, I, you are better than me. That's why I'm envious of you. No, but I, I, 
I don't want to admit that you are better than me. Why are you better than me? You don't deserve that. I deserve that. So that is envy. So Duryodhan was very envious of the Pandavas. And he believed that he was a good person. And that's why he couldn't believe, I'm a good person. Why would God be against me? And therefore, because Krishna was with the Pandavas, he concluded based on his assumption of his own virtue that Krishna could not be God. See his reasoning, he's not thinking. Oh, the sages and the, the wise people have told me that Krishna is God. And if God is fighting against me, I must, have I done something wrong? Maybe I need to change my ways. But instead, you're so convinced that I'm a good person and God can't be against a good person. Therefore, whoever is against me can't be God. That was his twisted reasoning. Now, with that reasoning, he embarked on this war. And when he was fighting this war, he, he, so the Kurukshetra war that happened, it ha in its length, it has a similarity with the Bhagavad Gita. Does anyone know what is the similarity? The war was for how many days? 18, 18 days. And the Bhagavad Gita has how many chapters? 18. 18 chapters. So what happened is, on the fourth day, Duryodhan faced a severe reversal. His troops were severely battered by the Pandavas and especially by the most powerful among physically powerful among the Pandavas was Bhima. And Bhima and Duryodhan had a very strong rivalry. So on that day, Bhima just started, this went on a rampage. That he started destroying the Kaurava forces. And then seeing his forces being destroyed, Duryodhan charged forward. Until that day, they, the Bhima and Duryodhan really had not had a direct face-off. They were arch rivals and they were waiting for it. And on this day, Bhima seemed to be like operating at a completely different level. Duryodhan just couldn't match him. He was, Bhima was surrounded by opposing forces. Bhima was extremely powerful. As a baby, once he had his, his mother and father were sitting on the top of a mountain, looking at, looking at the scenery from the cliff. And his mother dozed off. And then suddenly in the distance, a tiger roared. The tiger roared, his mother just started off, started, and she sort of rose up. What happened? And the baby on her lap, which was Bhima, he fell off, he just flew off, and he fell off the cliff. His mother screamed in horror, and her father just tried to leap down the cliff, clamber down as fast as he could. And then they found at the bottom of the mountain, there was a shattered rock, and Bhima was just playing with his hands and limbs. <laughs> So he had that powerful a body. And what happened was that he, this Bhima went on a rampage. And Duryodhana thought that I will be easily able to defeat Bhima. But on this day, he couldn't even match Bhima. He was surrounded by a whole battalion of elephant warriors. Bhima just charged off, charged into that elephant battalion. And with his punch, fist started punching all those elephants. And yes, they got knocked off. Just by his punches. Duryodhana came in and Bhima just used his mace and knocked him off. Duryodhana was humiliated. He came back again and again. But each time, he, is not only he was defeated, but he became increasingly wounded. And then finally, he was withdrawn. His charioteer realized that he will die if he stays here. So he retreated. And he felt even more angry. Because he's, now he's, he's seen as a coward who fled from the battlefield. And he came back after he had recovered a little. At that time, Bhima had been engaged by some other warriors. And Bhima's son was Ghatotkach. He came forward and he said, you are, like a, you, are like, you are Bhima's son, so you are like my son. Go away as long as my anger is not increased. So Ghatotkach was also very powerful. He said, that the work which my father has not yet completed, I will complete for him today. He said, I will destroy you. Duryodhan couldn't tolerate this insolence. You kid, you think you can destroy me? He's already angry with his father. He said, like your father is arrogant, you are also arrogant. So that is the nature of the, the conditioned mind. See, the, if we are arrogant, we believe that others are arrogant. That's how it works. So, yeah. 
that's my return. Oh, thank you. So that day, so Ghatotkac and Bhima started fighting. Sorry, Ghatotkac and Duryodhan started fighting. And on, and Ghatotkac was very skilled. And it could be that Duryodhan had an off day or whatever. In a short while, Ghatotkac started getting the upper hand of Duryodhan. Duryodhan couldn't believe it. He had thought he was going to defeat the father, and now the father had defeated him, the son was also defeated. So it was humiliating. And the more fiercely he was fighting, the more he seemed to be missing. The, he was not able to target Bhutotkach, and Ghatotkac seemed to be becoming stronger and stronger. And finally, he started getting more and more battered. And he said, he, he now he couldn't flee. He couldn't flee from his opponent, rival son. Somehow he was mustering his strength and fighting, but he just couldn't. Fortunately for him, at that time, the sun set. The sun set means at that time, the battles were fought like sports matches. Like suppose there's a cricket match or a football. A cricket match goes on for a long time, several days sometimes. So in the morning it starts, evening it ends. So it ended. And that evening, all, generally the custom was all the warriors would assemble. Like in a sports team, if one half of the sports match is over, then the, in the coach calls all the team members and they have a debriefing kind of thing. What happened? What should we do next? So in the evening, all the warriors of the Kaurava side were having a debriefing session. And at that time, Duryodhan asked Bhishma. Bhishma was the eldest among all of them. He said, you know, oh, grandsire, I have you, I have Dronacharya on my side, who is the teacher of most of the warriors on the battlefield. And I have, I have far more our, our military strength than my opponents. And my number is better. And the warriors on my side are more experienced. And yet, how is it that I am being defeated again and again and again? Just today, the kind of reversals I and my army have faced, I'm unable to process them. Why is this happening? And at that time, Bhishma became grave. And Bhishma said, Oh son, Turyodhana uh, was his grandson. He speaking some, sometimes affectionately as a son. So he said that, I have told this to you again and again. In fact, I have cried myself hoarse trying to tell this to you. But since you have asked, I will repeat it again. Yes. There has not been, there is not, and there will not be any army in the entire universe that can defeat the Pandavas because they have Krishna on their side. Duryodhana had been chastened and he said, can you tell me who is Krishna? And Vishma in his thought, at last, at last he's asking this question, who is Krishna? And then it is one of the few incidents in the Mahabharata where Krishna's childhood pastimes are described. In the, in the Bhagavatam, Krishna's childhood pastimes are described in the 10th canto in quite detail. But the Mahabharata focuses on the Pandava's childhood. So there's just a reference when the Pandavas meet Krishna for the first time in uh, after Draupadi's wedding that, that, you know, he was also a great hero. But here for the first time he describes this Krishna is not no ordinary warrior nor is he an extraordinary warrior because he is the supreme being. He is a supreme warrior. Even when he was a small infant, he was a fearsome demoness who brutally killed babies. And Krishna effortlessly neutralized her. He lifted up a giant mountain when he was just seven years old. Demons who had terrorized even the gods, those demons were effortlessly, playfully, Bala Kridana Kam Iba. Like a child playing with a toy. They were toyed with by Krishna and they were eliminated. And he kept describing the glories of Krishna. Now, this was Bhishma's heart. Bhishma was a great devotee. Somehow, circumstantially, he had to fight against the Pandavas. But his heart was always devoted to Krishna. And he had that hope somewhere at the back of his mind. That maybe the Duryodhana's heart might also change. And then Duryodhana might also become 
devoted to Krishna. And now he saw that his words were being heard. Generally, when a speaker is speaking, the speaker is also a conversation. Even if mostly once a person is speaking, still the speaker is observing whether the person is hearing, how well they are hearing, and what is the response. So, sometimes if the audience is not interested, then what happens is, or instead looking at the watch, looking at the door, looking everywhere except the speaker. <laughs> That's they then say they are not interested. But sometimes there's a, like a big blank look on the audience. It's like suppose somebody is watching a foreign language movie without subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> then there is not much to understand. He's trying to be entertained a little bit by seeing all the action. So it's like that. So Bhishma was observing and Bhishma was seeing that Duryodhana was listening. And that's why he was, he's feeling happy. And he continued describing Krishna's glories. And finally Duryodhana became very sober. And he said, we will plan our strategy tomorrow. And they left. And that night when Duryodhana went to his tent for sleeping, he was still pondering Bhishma's words. And then he knew on the opposite side where the Pandavas were, tents were. And he turned in the direction of Krishna's tent. And he said, if Krishna is God, there's no loss in offering, in bowing down to him. So he bowed down in the direction of Krishna. That's the only time Duryodhana bowed down to Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went to, the, and actually when he bowed down to Krishna, he felt like a strange kind of peace coming on him. And then he fell asleep. And he fell asleep and he had a, he initially thought he had a, he, most nights of the Kurukshetra war, he had a very fitful sleep. Because it's a war, so much at stake. And he knew that he wanted, he, it was he who had primarily caused the war because he wanted the Pandavas to leave. But this night he had a very peaceful sleep. And the next morning he woke up and he was refreshed. But unfortunately, he forgot why he was refreshed and he remembered why he was fighting the war. So again, what happened was, he said, enmity. okay, yesterday was just one bad day. Things like this, bad days happen. But today I will win. And again, he started fighting. Next day when Bhishma saw Duryodhan marching towards the head of the military formation. Just seeing Duryodhana's face, Bhishma's heart sank. He realized that the words that he had spoken last night had an, had an impact, but only for a short while. So that impact was like what? Was it like light or like lightning? Mm. Like lightning. lightning. So why is this? That why is sometimes why do sometimes words have an impact like light and sometimes like lightning? War. War? Hmm. No, no. What was the question? Okay. Why war? Yeah. Why do sometimes words of wisdom, no, words. words of wisdom, illuminate like like light and change a person's understanding and concept purpose of life? And sometimes they are like lightning. It, yeah, please. Very nice explanation. Thank you. And also, yeah. uh, could also depend on the Bhaktivam Bhakti Sukhritsa. On the no, Bhaktivam Bhakti Bhakti Yes, on what they have done in the past. True. See, both the answers are valid. I just like to take a different perspective here. That, that we also have stories in the Bhakti tradition or in the general spiritual tradition of people who are in deep Tamaguna. Even they are transformed. Can you, if you think of some stories, somebody who was like a... Uh, Ajamila. Yeah, he was in deep ignorance. Another story of a somebody very brutal getting transformed by the name of God. Jagai Madai is a hunter. Brigari. Brigari. Brigari was a hunter who loved to. Yeah. Uh, Rakugana, Maharaj Rakugana. 
Okay, Rahogun was not really, he was in ignorance, but not really deep ignorance. Like Rajas. Like Rajas, 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 Rajas. In fact, it's also described that Rahogun was actually going to, uh, going to an assembly of sages to hear from them. But he was going there in a royal conception, not a subsidiary conception. So it is more like a social function than a learning occasion for him when he was going there. Yeah, so Mrugari was the example of a hunter who loved to half kill animals. So there are examples of people who are in deep tamas and they were also transformed. So tamas is a part, definitely a part of the reason, uh, but it is not the whole reason. It is not just, see there are two things. What we have, it could be in terms of conditionings. So we have a conditioning of tamas, of ignorance. But it is what we want to have. We may have particular conditionings, but how strongly are we holding on to those conditionings? That is the key thing. So it's basically, ultimately, all transformation begins with the fundamental power that we always have with us. And that is the power to desire. The desire is the fundamental power which is never taken away from us. Now, where that desire will be directed, that can be shaped by many things. And sometimes in spiritual circles, desire sometimes is demonized or desires bind us. Like in the Buddhist tradition, it is said, Asha hi parmam dukkham, nirasham parmam sukham. That desire is the cause of all distress. And if we just become free from desire, we will become happy. Well, it's not that simple. Because if you consider rajas to be the characteristic of uh, filled with desires, lobha, Pravrittirarambha karmanam ashamahasprava. Krishna says in 14.12 in the Gita that lots of desires being present. When desire is crowding and clouding the consciousness, that is the characteristic of rajas. But now, so that is true, but one of, now desires can be removed in two ways. One is that we realize oh, these desires are not worth fulfilling. Therefore, I don't want to pursue them. Or another way is, I am not worth having these desires fulfilled. And that will take one down. And if you consider depression now is a, world, is a very worldwide increasing mental health problem. And one of the characteristics of depression is the absence of desire. There's not even a desire to get up from bed. Just don't want to do anything. So just getting rid of desire is not going to enlighten us. If, if the, what is that, what is happening? Why is somebody depressed? It's not that they, they don't have desires. They try to hold a job. Maybe they got fired. They try to get into a relationship and maybe the other person left them. Maybe they try to improve their health and they just couldn't lose weight or they couldn't become fit. And whatever they tried, they just didn't work. And then what is happening over here is they're thinking, I am not worth having any of my desires fulfilled. And then they give up desires, not because those desires have lost the charm, but because they have lost their sense of self. worth And that is a very dangerous place to be. In. Because so in one sense, if somebody has to come out of depression, sometimes depression can be a clinical situation where somebody needs some medication. But it cannot be a one-pronged approach. Just give medicines and depression will go away. No, along with that, some, some, not sometimes, most of the times, that person has to be infused with the will to live, the will to do something. And it may be a small thing. It may start with maybe some small act of maybe service, make something that makes the person feel, I can make a difference in someone's life. So quite often, when people get the desire to do something, that's when they come from tamas to rajas at least. So, the point was I was making is that why we were discussing this depression was a slightly different topic, but the point we were discussing is that why is some why do some people receive knowledge and become enlightened, and why do some people don't? That's not just because ignorance or tamas is present in them; it is how much they are attached to their ignorance. How much are they attached to their own way of thinking? So, like, one of my friends 
is a chaplain in a hospital. So he was telling me that he often goes, when he goes to hospitals, he offers to offers patients. In, uh, I'm a chaplain and I, I can I can talk with you and I can pray for you. So there was one patient in the hospital, he was there for a long time. And uh, he, this patient said, I don't want to talk with any chaplain at all. And then finally, he somehow decided to approach him and he says, you know, I've been seeing you for a long time and I've been praying for you. And as soon as he said this, it's almost like all the alarm beeps on all the devices started going up. And the nurses and everything came. What happened? And they pacified him. But he didn't, I didn't do anything. He said that. You know, and this, this patient was like frantically pointing towards him, but he did something. What did you do? Said, I just said that I have been praying for him. And he was pointing again. He says, what did you he says, when he said, so this patient finally, when he came back to his little coherence, he said, when he said that he's been praying for me, I felt, am I so seriously sick that somebody needs to pray for me? <laughs> and that caused a panic attack. <laughs> so that praying could be an act of caring. He just didn't have that conception. It prays are something which you offer when somebody is about to die or something like that. That was his idea. So what happens is, we have certain conceptions and we process the world through those conceptions. So if we are holding on to those conceptions, like earlier I started by, I'm now completing this talk in a cycle, we're going down a cycle. I started with unguided and misguided. So a misguided person is controlled by some conceptions and they see everything through those conceptions. So what happens is that even if somebody does something for them, they filter it through their own preconception and they don't learn much because they are only holding on to their worldviews. So that's why uh, as uh, you know, we can help the unable, but we can't help the unwilling. Hmm? Unable means say, we invite somebody for a program and they say, you know, actually, I stay very far away and uh, I can't come. Then you say, I can, I can arrange a ride for you. Oh, you know, but uh, actually, I don't like to ride with strangers. And then they say, okay, I can personally come and pick you up. He says, no, actually, you know, that time I'm not available. So now, sometimes what happens is that that person is making an excuse. We know that they're making an excuse. And they know that we know that they are making an excuse. <laughs> but at least here, they're trying to be courteous. They're not coming out flat out and saying, I won't come. But imagine if somebody says, we invite somebody for a program. And they say, even if I die, my dead body will never come to your program. <laughs> <laughs> so that is <coughs> like a vehement antipathy. It's a strong aversion, aversion feeling like that. So even, so if somebody is in that state, then we can't help them. And then all that we can do is pray from a distance and hope that uh, maybe some change in their life will change their mind eventually and they'll become more open. But even God, God can't, even hearing God's glories, even Krishna himself came to Duryodhana and offered peace on very accommodating terms. But that was not accepted by, the, by Duryodhana. So what happens is, for each one of us, it's important when we are dealing with people, <laughs> are they unable or are they unwilling? And in our case also, we need to be honest. When we say, I can't do this. It may be, we may be in a situation we we really can't do something. But we have to check, am I unable or am I unwilling? So if somebody is unable, they can be helped. And if not now, they can become able a little later with our help. But if somebody is unwilling, then even God can't help. As they say, God helps those who help themselves. Now we can put it that way. It's, it's, that is true. But sometimes this saying is used by atheists to say that, there is no need to pray to God. There is no need to go to temple. You just do your work. That's how you are helping yourself. And then God will help you. Well, that's not the exact meaning of that. God helps those who help themselves. What it means is that God is always there to help us. 
we help ourselves by being open to change by by being ready to think okay what in this situation can i do to make things better or what can i stop doing that i that is making things worse so anukulya se sankalpa pratikulya se varjanam accept what is favorable accept and avoid what is what is unfavorable this can have meanings at multiple levels but at the, at a very basic level any situation we are in is ask these two questions what can i do to make things better and what can i stop doing to make things worse and you may say that there's nothing i can do in this situation really i say i'm in a very bad relationship you know i have a partner i have a child i have a sibling i have bra- i have a parent who just doesn't understand me just is very oh i have a boss who is making my life miserable we can say that there's nothing i can do about it okay maybe there's nothing we can do about changing that person but does that mean that we can't do anything about our life at all does that person have that much control over our life sometimes what happens is uh some people you know they are in a part of our life but we bring them into the whole of our life that means yes nobody has to occupy our mind 24 hours a day mm-hmm. except from except for krishna of course when we become fully devoted to him mm-hmm. uh, but the point is we let them somebody may be troubling us but they can only trouble us while we are interacting with them and maybe a little bit afterwards we get scarred by their interactions but it is we who let them stay in our minds so like it's like a somebody who is a predator you know somebody say we have made many properties imagine I'll conclude with two points now uh, we have many properties and one of the properties has been taken over by some tenant who is just not ready to leave and they are creating a big uh, legal mess and we just not able to get them out. Now imagine such a person who is staying in one part of our house is unwanted over there, and we tell them, "Okay, you can come and take up all over my prop, all of my property." What nonsense! It's already occupying one un- property against our will. Why would we let that person come and take all our property? We would try to drive that person out from there. So physically, we would never do that, but psychologically, that is what we do. In one area of our life, there is some person who is disagreeable. and that person is troubling us but we let that person occupy our entire mind you know and because that person is not treating us well we start speaking rudely with others we start becoming curt with others and so the person who is troubling us that person we let them live rent free not just in one corner of our head but our full head and does it is we who are making things worse and at such times that is where okay what can i do okay, i can stop thinking about this person i can stop thinking about how miserable this person is making my life it may be to that person my making my life miserable but it is i who am making my life more miserable by thinking about how that person is making my life miserable so it is that i can stop and this is where our bhakti yoga practice can be very helpful the bhakti yoga practice is not just a ritual chant the holy names or hear some classes it is training our mind to focus on krishna so we can't we can't literally drive drive people drive anybody out of anything out of our head as i think during the pandemic the government had made a rule that no tenants will be evicted even if they don't pay and a lot of landlords had some problems because of that and then they could say it was out of compassion but it created problems you, know, you can't they said you cannot legally get anybody out of the out of their homes but so it's like that you know we can't get anything out of our head because if the, what happens is the the if we think i'm not going to think about something what are we doing we are thinking about that thing isn't it i think psychologists do this experiment quite often so for the next one minute please don't think of a pink monkey except for a pink monkey you can think of whatever you want just don't think of a pink monkey mm-hmm. what happens <laughs> you may never have thought of a pink monkey in our life but when somebody tells you don't think about a pink monkey we can't think about a crazy thing as a pink monkey how did the monkey become pink did it fall in a pink paint box paint box or was it genetically mutated it became pink 
uh, what happened <laughs> so we can't not think of something but what we can do is so we can't drive any thought out of our mind but we can crowd certain thoughts out of our mind so bhakti is about filling our mind with krishna and we fill our mind with krishna then unwanted thoughts get crowded out so for us that desire even is a small desire okay what is it that i am doing which is that i can stop doing which is making which will which is what is it that i am i can stop doing which is making things worse and what is it that i can start doing which will make things better so okay thinking about somebody who is troubling me i can stop thinking about or at least stop decrease thinking about them and how can i decrease by increasing my thinking about krishna so when we chant the holy names we say my, my mind is wandering here and there i can't focus okay that's fine but still still we are practicing and through that practice focus will increase and that is how we will all become parts of the solution so that for spiritual wisdom to stick you no know, we what we need primarily is the desire to change and how do you get the desire to change by just thinking what can i do to make things better and what can i stop doing to that is making things worse so from that so these two simple questions anukulya se santal ho tikulya se varjana we can open our heart to the divine and then the wisdom that comes in that will land in our heart and that will transform our heart that will enable us to get, get access to divine power to make change positive changes that we might have earlier thought impossible for ourselves and that is the ultimate magic in our life the magic of krishna is not just sometimes we go to temple and we see the deities or we dance in kirtan and we feel very good because that is the magic of bhakti no doubt but a far more enduring magic of bhakti is that we find ourselves becoming empowered to change ourselves for the better in ways that we thought was beyond us because that is a magic that will stay with us that is what will enable us to steadily improve till we become all that krishna wants us to become till we realize our full human potential and our spiritual potential so i'll summarize i spoke three main points today i started by talking about how uh, when, the topic was when knowledge works to remove ignorance and when it does it and that connection started with 1822 in the gita that if we are equating one thing with everything then our we our knowledge reinforces our ignorance so we discussed several examples of that the alcoholic thinking about how they interpreted the germs in the alcohol bottle and then we talked about how duryodhan so we have to our mind can be unguided and misguided so and misguided mind has to unlearn what it thinks it knows like a person who is going on the wrong track and thinks they are going on the right track so in that connection the second part of the elaborate is called the story of duryodhan and how for a brief while he was he was illumined but that illumination was that like that coming from lightning and not from a light source why because his envy was so deep rooted that it came back to him it came back and overwhelmed him so he held on not to the light of the wisdom that came from bishma but he held on to the darkness that came from the envy in his own heart and then we discuss so what what can we last part was what can we what makes one chair person changeable and another not and what can we do but what can we do to make the make the change so it is not just the presence of ignorance that's true but it is more of the desire to hold on to the ignorance so desire itself is not a bad thing because absence of desire can be transcendence but absence of desire can also be deep ignorance where person goes into depression so for us at our level it's more important to have the desire to change and that we can begin simply by asking what can i do to make things better and what can i stop doing that is making things worse and from there we will be able to go on that transformative journey and access krishna's power which can bring about enduring magical transformation in our lives thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna, hare krishna. Uh,
any questions comments reflections yes my challenge i face is when i'm chanting so many thoughts are coming you know i'm trying to change you know when i have desire to chant so nicely and focusly but it's so many things are coming in my mind and sometimes i'm thinking that morning that day so many services are to so and i try to set a goal but after a couple of days again it starts and starts so mm-hmm. is it just coming yeah. maybe you need to do more reading or what yeah. okay so in chanting our mind wanders a lot yes well my understanding is that uh, sometimes by over emphasizing chanting we make chanting more difficult than it needs to be what do i mean by that see it's not just chanting is not just chanting in one sense we want to develop a relationship with krishna and our relationship with krishna is developed through many activities when we serve the deities we are we are acting in relationship with krishna when we are cooking we are acting in relationship with krishna when we are doing various services that's also developing a relationship with krishna so the point is our the gopis in the spiritual world if we consider them as our models they are not just like sitting and struggling to chant they are spontaneously chanting and they are also doing various services they are churning butter for krishna and they are chanting uh, they are going out to do various activities like say they finish the churning butter they want to sell the butter they say they are trying to chant krishna names so for them they have a richly developed relationship with krishna so at our level it's at least this is my understanding and uh, i would say this is my current understanding it may change also my so that's why i said that we, if we over endeavor to try to improve our chanting then what happens is we become distracted dissatisfied discouraged and then in other areas of our bhakti where we could be serving enthusiastically and thereby developing our relationship with krishna we stop doing even that oh my chanting is of no use so what is the use of distributing books what is the use of cooking for deities what is the use of doing other services and then what happens then the relationship is not there and chanting no matter just by will power how much can we improve? we can but not much so let's try to focus on developing our relationship with krishna and if there's one place if somebody loves deity worship then be grateful that we have that one attraction to krishna and then try to see as you said hearing more about chanting is good but more important is like try to connect the chanting with the activity that connects us most with most with krishna so instead of thinking that i'm just chanting these holy names uh, okay and i love these deities and those same deities are manifesting as the holy name so for me i find my greatest connection with krishna is through the bhagavad gita so during my chanting when my mind wanders and wanders constantly i try to think of the, my favorite gita verses and maybe i just pause a little bit chant a few gita verses or chant one verse several times and it really comes when it is the same krishna who spoke the gita that same krishna is his name i am calling out so i feel that once we get that sense of there's a relationship within which i am calling out these names then the connect uh, then the connection through the holy names also becomes a little more personal and that will organically lead to the improvement of chanting otherwise just using will power and not succeeding and getting disheartened it it can be counterproductive okay. thank you hare krishna Any other questions? Is that a half-raised hand? Say <laughs> it. Is that a half-raised hand? <laughs> uh, uh, in this case, no questions. Uh, the comments. Uh, Please. Um, in the second chapter of the Yoga Sutra, Sutra Tantra, in the very beginning, uh, it is said that there are five causes of suffering, starting from avidya, the, the ignorance. And basically, this is something that includes both either misdirection or Uh, either misguidance or unguidance, and on the example of Duryodhana, we can see that he was um, uh, he didn't have the right knowledge in regards to the in regards to God, Krishna, the spiritual knowledge. He had uh, so much asmita of the of the false ego with the all those detailed aspects like envy and all, all the rest. He had so many 
the Raga Dvesha Pnivesha, so you have the, the attachments to the material opulence, uh, the Dvesha towards the Andavas and like envy. And um, in the ninth chapter, I mean, in the ninth mantra of Sri Shakanishat, we we can learn that uh, false knowledge is more dangerous than yeah. uh, than ignorance because this is basically an example of uh, why someone who uh, who is deep rooted in, in the the false knowledge why it's more dangerous because it means he has so many I mean he has too too many arguments that we uh, probably won't be, uh, won't won't be able to defeat the right knowledge and that's why for him it's more about receiving the lightning instead of the light of knowledge. And um, in regards to what you were saying uh, of the, the, the desires and um, like uh, our attachments to the certain uh, like sense objects, I recall in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the verses um, 58 and 59, uh, Krishna is talking about um, uh, in the same way as the tort uh, turtle can uh, the uh, it can detach its limbs from the sense objects. Uh, it's pretty much the same way uh, we can detach ourselves from something that is that is wrong, something that can uh, that, that could produce like bad samskaras, could produce like, bad karma and everything. So this is something that is in psychology is called the negative way, way of control. And then in the very next in the very next verse, we uh, we can see the the positive way of control where. Um, or it's Krishna saying Yukta that uh, we, can, we can replace the lower taste by experiencing a higher taste, and this is the South West. Yes, thank you. A lot of apt references. That is a key point that what you said, that we can't really simply live without taste. At the very least, even if there is no taste, we may say, I have no taste in bhakti. But then at the very least, so the taste which Krishna talks about over there, is not necessarily pleasure itself. It can also be purpose. Just having a clear purpose in our mind, that itself gives a certain level of pleasure. It may be a very preliminary level of pleasure. But just having a purpose. So, okay, somebody is sick and they have not been exercising, they are not been regulating their diet, not taking medicine regularly. Just have a purpose. I am going to get healthy. Now that itself may not make them healthy, but that can set them up to on the path. So the sometimes we may say that okay, I need a higher taste will help me to get give up lower taste. But I have no higher taste. So how can I give up the lower taste? Well, we can have the higher purpose to pursue the higher taste. That itself also is, is, is the is sufficient. And that's how many people work in one sense that uh, say if somebody is somebody is quite unfit and they go to a gym. It's not that going to the gym gives them pleasure. It could be it could be exhausting. It could be sometimes the limbs pain at that time. But there's a higher purpose. So the taste which Param Drishtva Nivartati, which Krishna uses in 261, that is it's significant. Drishtva actually means vision. Let Prabhupada translates that taste. The different Acharyas are translated differently. But Drushtva is associated with Drushti. And Drushti means vision. So Param Drushtva Nivartati. Once one gets the higher understanding, the higher vision, oh, there is a, there is a better way to live. There is a higher purpose to pursue. I may not be there right now. But just there is a better way to live. That is the technique. So, so, so you could say we're drawing the limbs. That is like saying this is not the way to live. This is not what I want to be doing in my life. But okay, that's good. That we know what we don't want to be doing. But it's more important to know what we want to be doing. So Param Drishtva, that is the higher vision. So higher taste can simply begin with a higher purpose. or That is the purpose to gain a higher taste. And there's a taste even in that itself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So how do you know that you're on the right path? Like what you are doing is kind of whether it's in now, where you want to go or have that, develop that relationship with Krishna. How do we know we are on the right path? You could say broadly two things. One is intelligence and the other is experience. So it's like 
if uh, we are sick and we are taking going to a particular doctor now how do we know that the doctor is good you may say okay there is certification we have to check whether the doctor is certified by the medical board or whatever but then there could be people who are certified with medical board who are not competent isn't it so we use our intelligence intelligence means when we go to the doctor as the doctor gives some explanation of why we are suffering why we are in pain does it make sense to us hmm? if i have if i have digestive problem the doctor says you have to amputate your leg what that makes no sense at all so so you have to use our intelligence to hmm? the intelligence basically is about the rational aspect does this make sense it is god who has given us our intelligence and he wants us to use it even in the bhagavad gita krishna is god himself but you will see in the gita krishna never uses his godhood to impose on arjuna do this and don't do this if that was what krishna had wanted krishna would have finished the gita in five words or his six words i am god obey me fight gita over krishna didn't do that krishna actually reasons with arjuna and equips him with a process of reasoning by which one can arrive at a wise can judicious conclusion and that was in the end of the gita says vimrishita dashishina iti chitta kuru deliberate deeply and then do as you desire that's 1863 in the gita so the point is we are all meant to use our intelligence and then the second part is experience so uh, when we go to a doctor okay the doctor's diagnosis makes sense but is that prescription transforming me is it may help making my health better and then we have certain parameters okay at least the uh, pain because of the acidity in my belly is decreasing maybe i'm able to take food i'm maybe feeling feeling more energized we have to look at our own experience so similarly when we are on a particular path we need to use our intelligence to evaluate overall is the world view associated with this path does it make sense does it answer the basic questions of life and then whatever i'm being told by this on this path is it making a positive difference in my life so if here what positive difference can we expect so that that also we need to use our intelligence to understand it i met a met a person where was it almost like in last uh, one month i went in seven eight places okay i think i was in uh, phoenix so then i met a person and he said that you know in the last six months i have oscillated between theism and atheism 18 times I said, really? How do you do that? <laughs> so he said, eighteen times I have prayed to God. Uh, eight times my prayer was fulfilled, so I oscillated towards theism. <laughs> Ten times my prayer was not fulfilled, so I also gravitated towards atheism. Now he made the criteria for. So I said, that's that's okay. There's some kind of logic in that, but God's existence is not contingent on the fulfillment of our prayers. if he exists he exists if he doesn't exist he doesn't exist so he, so that's why when if somebody makes their experience this that i prayed to god and my prayer was answered therefore god exists or i prayed to god my prayer was not answered therefore god doesn't exist that experience is not a valid criteria hmm. for deciding whether god exists or not so similarly we also need to know what are the valid criteria so the valid criteria of of being on a on a path on a spiritual path is not just the fulfillment of our various desires it is more we could say the transformation of our values the transformation of our values that means if we grow spiritually if we are on a authentic spiritual path what we value will change change of values means so for people for a child what are the values of a child child just wants a food to eat and toys to play with for the child toys are the most valuable thing in life maybe as people grow up maybe in teenagers the most valuable thing for them maybe if they share their photos on instagram how many likes they get they don't get enough likes at the end of life end of the world for them so values change so if we grow spiritually then what will happen is we'll realize that there are many things in the world that are temporary sometimes sometimes my plans will succeed sometimes my plans will fail sometimes people will respect me sometimes people will disrespect me all this is not that important 
you know, my connection with the eternal, my inner composure, that clarity that comes by my connection with the eternal, that is much more important. So if we are on an authentic spiritual path, we will find that not that problems will stop coming to us, but when problems come to us, we will be able to face them with greater composure. So 10 years ago, before I started the spiritual path, if this kind of, if somebody had spoken like this to me, you know, I would have shut myself in a room for 10 days and not want to see anyone. I would be so shaken and shattered. But now, maybe for 15, 20 minutes, I was really hurt. But after that, I was able to go on with my life. That indicates we have changed. We have developed inner strength. So I would say that is, so experience means our experience of how we are able to process life's ups and downs. It is not the experience that my life will only have ups and no more downs. And that's the, that's the proof that my I'm on the right path. That is never going to happen. But how we are able to process life's ups and downs. So intelligence and experience are the two ways we can assess whether the path makes sense and whether following the path brings about a change in my values. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you. I do have a question. Yes, please. Sometimes we feel, in terms of receiving the knowledge, we do know internally the knowledge, knowledge is correct, but for whatever reason, false ego or envy, we sort of are willing to receive the knowledge if it is given by the person who we like. And if it's given by a person who's not on our platform of you know, being liked, Despite the fact my mind knows the knowledge is correct, my false ego comes in between and I'm not willing to accept the knowledge because it's coming from somebody maybe who's much junior than me, either through age or spiritual level. How do we, how do we transcend that? Okay, that's a good question. So even when you know something is right, if it comes from the source that we like, then it's much more acceptable for us. Otherwise, there is a like a, like a visceral negative reaction to it. I just don't want to accept it some, from somebody who is a junior or in some way, we have some negative dynamic with them. Yeah. I would say that the two aspects to this. First is that we are not just spiritual beings. We are sentient spiritual beings. And our emotions are a part of who we are. And that's why the the Bhagavatam also says that in the first canto that the we can learn spiritual knowledge from those who are snigdha, who are affectionate. So, so the relationship between the teacher and the student needs to be affectionate. Without that, the knowledge, it's very difficult to, to internalize that and let it transform us. So we, we, we can't set for ourselves unrealistic standards of submissiveness. The, the human or the emotional side of us is, is very much a part of who we are. At the same time, the emotional side is a part of us. It shouldn't become the whole of us. So what, what does that mean? That means that if someone has said something to us which came in an unpalatable emotional context, whether the relationship is not so healthy or whether that person's way of saying it was not proper, the setting in which they said it is not, not proper, whatever. So then, uh, okay, we may need to temporarily distance ourselves from that. Okay, I, I can't accept this right now, but that doesn't mean I have to reject this. It doesn't mean I have to condemn it. It will like suspend it for a time. Being. And then maybe talk with someone else. Maybe talk with someone whom we, whom we have a better emotional dynamic with. And maybe they will re-articulate in some other more palatable words. They'll present it in a way that is more acceptable for us. So now, apart from that also, from the other person, other side, that it is important, that's why those who are spiritual guides, to try to have a positive emotional dynamic with those whom they're guiding. Mm -hmm. Sometimes guides have to be hard, as they say, there's tough love. Mm -hmm. But in the tough love, the, the test is at the end of it, not immediately, but at the 
end of it, does the other person remember the tough part or the love part? So if it is mostly tough and hardly love, then that is going to be counterproductive. Like many times uh, parents sometimes ask, you know, how do we make our children devotees? So my answer is we can never make anyone a devotee. Everyone has to choose to become a devotee. But what parents can do is try to give their children as many joyful memories of Krishna Bhakti as possible. And then when the children grow up, when they come to teenage or adult, young adults, they are going to make their decision. So if their prominent memory from childhood, oh, I went to the temple and we danced with Kirtans and we had nice prashadam and I played their, played in this drama of Krishna Leela and it was so wonderful. They will want to be a part of that. But if you force the children, you have to wake up early in the morning. You have to sit and chant these many rounds. Then the, the memories will be, oh, this Krishna Bhakti means I was forced to so many, do so many things I didn't like. And those memories will shape their choices later. So, so from the other perspective, when those who guide need to make sure that they have a positive emotional dynamic overall. Occasionally, strong words have to be spoken and some disciplinary action has to be taken. But it's important that the positive emotional dynamic be maintained. Does it answer the question? Yes.